Well, this is Aaron Murakami down here in um, California at Steve McGreevy's uh, secret radio lab here. And this is actually where he uh, builds his uh, frequency devices for listening in to the uh, Earth sound. This is what Parsley There's built. A, Parsley the built of one. Uh, WR3. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got to four on order that I've got to hustle out in the next two weeks. And, uh, you know, the parts come in and then I incrementally uh, put them together. The potentiometer, mm -hmm. the knob. The BNC jack all gets screwed on the cases, and then uh, the circuit circuit board gets put into it, and uh, then they get a little test, and out they go. And of course, that's on AuroralChorus.com, and I'll yeah. subtitle this with the with the website. And so this has been kind of a uh, kind of a surprise trip. We didn't really plan on coming here. We were yeah. Um, uh, I'm very happy. I haven't seen uh, you since uh, the conference in 2015. And uh, mm -hmm. no, no, wait a minute. It was December. Uh, Right, December of that year, uh, we met in for a couple of days. That's right, of course. Uh, Eric's lab, Eric's secret lab. But uh, yeah, Eric, I guess had an eye infection and needed to come south. So good, you could. Yeah, come he's in, here. Well, Excellent. Well, Lone Pine and <laughs> took me an ambulance up to uh, yeah. uh, Bishop, and so on my way down wow. to uh, Eric's shop, then we had to you know detour it over there. And since you're only 15 miles from uh, Lone Pine or so, or so. Yeah. so I might as well, you know, swing by and <laughs> pay a visit. Head a little east into the uh, raw desert. Right, right. And so the, the small unit you showed, that was, that was probably the most popular one, and you got a big, you have a larger unit there with... Yeah, this one was, is, uh, was developed uh, for as a prototype for a company in Iceland, and you can see it here, ElfTech, and uh, they're online, so... Uh, I think it's elftech.is, and uh, it's for an eventual proprietary still uh, autumn 2017 uh, um, project we're doing. Actually, a couple, but uh, it's just this is a it's got a nice speaker on it, and you can hear just getting the power line uh, hum. It's very loud and bassy, or you can high pass, low pass, high pass it. And uh, it was just a proto development, but. I love the uh, metal box ones. Two of them I made uh, for Iceland so much, I just threw together one in a plastic case so I could uh, have the same thing. <laughs> and uh, it's been fun. A couple weeks ago, I was up in the town of uh, Darwin, in the, by the old cemetery in Darwin, California, this little town of 35 people, and uh, heard loud whistlers at like uh, 8.30 in the morning there with that unit blaring out the speakers. So I headed... Uh, uh, west a few miles and erected a magnetic loop and did some more serious listening. So it's like right on the edge of a uh, Death Valley. Yeah, uh, Darwin is right on the uh, right on really literally about three miles from the oh. edge of Death Valley National Park, the eastern edge. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's this famous road, the old highway to Death Valley. Uh, it's not Highway 190 into the Panamint Valley now. It went through Darwin. Uh, uh, and uh, then it went through Darwin Wash, which is just an amazing wonderland of a river and trees and uh, a pond, and it's all hidden in this canyon, Darwin Canyon, and then it would go from there to the Panamint Valley and eastward. That was the old Death Valley Road. So a lot of tourists like to go uh, into Darwin and go the old Death Valley route. It's really a beautiful uh, way to go, and you get treated with the uh, greenery and the canyon. So... Uh, I love to go up there for visiting friends and for natural radio listening because uh, it's really my favorite area of Inyo County. And it's completely power line free being uh, uh, several uh, miles from power lines once you leave Darwin. And I love the granite boulder hills and I go in there and I, I'll set up loops hanging on Joshua trees. <laughs> Joshua trees make great uh, loop uh, supports and or I'll, li or I'll listen on the WR3 or uh, the... Uh, prototype uh, unit here. So, so is that large unit, is that going to be available on a Royal Chorus? We're hoping, yeah. Or? It may never be uh, actually commercially released, but, mm -hmm. and of course it would take a smaller form, but humans can't make surface mount technology. It's really, it's right robotic, but we can only put together like uh, larger components like DIP, uh, which is what I do. So it just has uh, this board and another auxiliary amp board, and uh, and then we wanted a nice big loudspeaker so tourists could listen to the aurora borealis sounds 
of natural radio, which up in the auroral zone, uh, where I've traveled to several times in Canada and Alaska, is wild. Natural radio up in Alaska, northern Canada is, is crazy. And Iceland too, and so the idea is to let visitors use a portable receiver and hear it for themselves. And I've maybe spoken too much on that subject, but uh, it's, well, whatever, but uh, we're going to hope, hopefully that happens uh, this fall or winter, uh, if at all, at all. And I probably will go back in the autumn to Reykjavik and we'll go into the uh, hinterlands and experiment uh, with auroral, uh, auroral zone uh, reception of ELF. And, and of course, for anybody who's who's not familiar with these type of uh, uh, sound, natural sounds, um, that you can listen to on your um, uh, devices. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of audio recordings available through auroral. Auroral chorus. chorus, yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm of course not the uh, uh, I'm not the first. This was natural radio, actually uh, ELF VLF radio. It's actually audio frequency radio waves. And in the old days, uh, as I was telling Erica and uh, Aaron earlier today, that uh, they were discovered with uh, Bell's assistant, Dr. Watson, would take one of Bell's uh, transducers, you know, like a prototype telephone, and hook it to uh, these several mile long wire, and he'd ground it. And uh, it was the days when there was no AC power, there was just telegraph lines. And of course, all that cacophony uh, of telegraph transmitting went off in the evening as the operators went home for the night and it left the uh, the uh, region completely electrically interference free and so Watson would hear whistlers and things on the telephone line and I've heard I've even heard whistlers on an old telephone out in the middle of the desert mm. so they're audio frequency radio waves and all they need is a special audio amplifier and that's where the WR3 is uh, designed to transform a high impedance uh, whip antenna uh, through a JFET to a lower impedance that'll feed a headphone amp. It's a basic circuit that I came up with in 90 and mm -hmm. 91, way back uh, 26 years ago. No, 30. I don't know, 25 something. And uh, it's it sells really well today uh, thanks to uh, Aaron's uh, support and my own website, auroralchorus.com. So, you know, it's just been an insatiable hobby I had in the uh, late 80s. I developed through another friend, Mike Mitticke, living in the uh, on, in Big Sur, California, and he was inland, and he would hook up uh, an amplifier to these really long wires, just like Watson did in 1873, and heard whistlers, and it was Solar Max in 88, 1988, and he was hearing wild things, and he would send me these, these uh, crappy, cheap cassette tapes with whistlers on them I'm going, oh my god, Mike, how can I do this? I'm living in Marin County, it's suburban, but I hike in the hills, uh, but it needs like, what, a mile long wire? Hmm, point rays, I don't know, impossible. And so uh, I didn't even think it was doable for me until uh, I went to Oregon in 1989 in the Alvor Desert and I rolled a 2,000 foot wire out on the sagebrush and grounded the receiver to my car a little Toyota Tercel, and I heard whistlers using a tape recorder amplifier and a couple of capacitors and inductor to get rid of uh, radio stations in, in, the, in the interference, in the amplifier. And I heard loud whistlers in the morning, and I went, oh my goodness, it's doable. And then I just began to experiment with the receivers, and in the northern Nevada desert, my girlfriend, uh, Gail, uh, as I was rolling up the wire, there's about 15 feet of wire left, a loud whistler howled through the headphones. And she said, Steve, you can hear whistlers on a really short antenna wire. I said, yeah, it ain't very sensitive, though. And she, she encouraged me to, like, design a receiver that might work with a, something, like, really portable, a whip antenna. So it was her incentive. And uh, in 1990 and 1991, I uh, began to develop prototypes for the WR3. And then my friend Frank Cathell in San Diego, now living in Tucson, uh, got to, we collaborated, and he, he designed the circuit board, which I still use today, and it's made by the same guy in San Diego. And it's DIP, it's old resistor, through the hole technology, but something that I can still create. Uh, and so I just pump out thousands of these over the last decade, and it's in the great cottage industry for me to hang out in my secret lab and be a hermit and uh, do the WR3s. 
and that gets put into the case and the other stuff and out they go and it was a real breakthrough because there was and then we sold it to popcom popular communications in 1991 and 92 and it sold like hotcakes uh because there's nothing like it on the market i had no competitors it was the first natural radio receiver uh sold commercially and and portable too right in the pocket and use headphones and uh now I've got a lot of competitors today, but this is the original, and uh, I've been fortunate to travel a lot and make recordings, too, of natural radio uh, over the decades up to Alaska and Canada and all over the western U.S. and uh, going into boonies, boondocks, remote areas to get away from the power grid, as, as I like to do for camping and hiking. And, and so this sort of coalesced a fascination of uh, audio recording, uh, amplifier work, uh, Nature, which I love, I'm definitely a greenie, and uh, radio, electromagnetism, which fascinates uh, me to no end. Uh, that's been my prime study since childhood is electromagnetism. I am just obsessed by it. And I began DXing the uh, AM broadcast band in the early 70s as like a ten, 9 or 10 year old. And I craved, like, like we have smartphones today, I ran around with transistor radios constantly. I, was, I always had one in my hand. Uh, so don't make fun of people who carry around smartphones everywhere. I was a kid that had radios always in my hand. Never went anywhere without one. And then I began to carry tape recorders too. So here's Steve McGreevy with his radio and tape recorder going everywhere. And so, you know, it sort of garnered a love of uh, recording all this stuff, documenting it with audio, beginning with reel-to-reel -reel and tape cassette to uh, digital today. I mean, magnificent. And now we can put it all online for the world to hear and enjoy. You know, in the old days, it was like mail the tapes around. <laughs> so now we can just like instantly tell the world, hey, the planet Earth and Jupiter and Saturn and a few others really sing a beautiful magnetosphere song uh, generated up in the magnetosphere. Uh, and if you like studying lightning storms, uh, the ELF band is exceptionally good for lightning study. Uh, if I was to take this outside anywhere away from the hum zone here, you could hear snap, crackle, pop. Well, that's lightning static. And to some it's annoying as heck, and others love it. It's a great way to research lightning. And I love it in the, in the uh, fall here when the monsoon hits and the thunderstorms happen in Inyo County and I'll go out at night and watch the lightning while, while I listen to the static. <laughs> in the uh, receiver so who else today who else but people like me like to listen to static you know it's annoying on the ham radio set but we love it at elf because it really takes on a pretty sound at night kind of a ringing pinging sound and a lot of people like those tweaky noises that lightning makes so you know you can study the natural radio signals of the uh, planet you can study uh, lightning storms uh, magnetosphere signals and tell your signals from earthquake earthquake uh, uh, the ULF has harmonics, and Eric Eric is studying Eric Dollard is studying the uh, telluric uh, earthquake uh, signal potentiality of uh, that you can actually listen to, were there to be a seismic event with one of these uh, uh, E-field receivers or magne magnetic loops. And Eric, of course, is is doing his long his long lines system, which is orders of magnitude more sensitive than whatever I can do, and his dynamic range is like 110 dB completely linear purely he's developing like complicated tube amps and so there's amazing things being done in 2017 by uh people i know now and i'm friends with globally and so i'm flying to Reykjavik iceland to consult there and uh, uh seeing what eric's doing in the nevada desert and uh, cal desert and it's really a an amazing thing to witness today i really do have to say uh despite our really weird political negative times maybe you got to look at all the cool things going on, too, besides. <laughs> Long answer there. <laughs> Dissertation. <laughs> so the, um, recently, there's been a couple of film crews uh, coming out to yeah. document your work. Um, are these going to be documentaries available on you know, Discovery yeah, Channel quite, or something? Or Discovery what, Channel. The, who, who's, who's producing uh, these? Well, uh, let, me go back, let me go back to 2010. I had a visitor, uh, uh, MFA student uh, Gord Kevin Gordon from Stanford U. He came with a, a digital recordist, uh, Sarah, and they sat here for a couple of days in this very room with a 16 millimeter wind-up black and white film camera. 
So that eventually became Tuned In, the name of the five minute documentary, black and white, and I went to the Mill Valley Film Festival and uh, they screened it and I did a whole talk about it two times in October 2010. And then uh, that got, that's actually on my Facebook page, Stephen McGreevy Facebook page. Uh, has that video? So they, it, <clears throat> so they uploaded it to YouTube. Or I something uploaded it. Yeah, I, okay. I, I had a digitized. I digitized a copy of it and uh, off a DVD and uploaded it. Uh, I didn't do it for many years because it was in in many uh, film festivals, including the, the 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 big one in France. They have the big one. Uh, can't remember the name of it at a moment. Uh, the Cannes uh, or something. Yeah, Cannes. Mm -hmm. Can yeah, Cannes. Yeah, yeah, it was in that. So that was a really major cool thing to happen. Uh, Aaron, you've uh, interviewed me in Tonopah in 2015, and then I got an email from a guy in Vancouver, Canada, from the National Film Board, a really well-known documentary film entity in uh, Canada, Mon based in Montreal, but they have a branch in Vancouver. And he connected with this uh, guy up there, um, and... Uh, they came down for an, in, an initial interview, this really nice fellow, and we went out near Darwin, east of here, and uh, he just interviewed me with a smartphone, and then I'd say something like, really cool, and he'd be like, back up, let me uh, get my thing out and record you, because we were just on a hike. Well, the moment's, the moment's been lost, but anyway, we, uh, we had an initial interview, we came in here and made a list, and he says, we'll be back. and. Uh, so he came back, uh, I'm trying to recall names here, uh, a, gr a group of four people. Uh, Kevin uh, was the first one, and uh, then Caroline, and a couple of film people came. And the NFB were here for two days to do a documentary. I was going to be part of uh, uh, five people doing some something, unusual uses of electricity. <laughs> and, and unusual, including listening to it. And what's radio? But it is electricity in a form, and uh, so it all coalesced. They came down here, did an amazing interview. We went out into the uh, Joshua Tree Forest. This really incredible Joshua Tree Forest uh, uh, above Centennial Flat, not far from where the 30-year-old uh, now U2 uh, the Joshua Tree album was photographed. The cover with Bono and the group, uh, the famous Joshua Tree, which is now toasted. But we were just about five miles east of there, higher up in a dense forest of them, and I erected a loop antenna. And uh, we hung out with a campfire into the night and uh, listened. Nothing but static was going on that night, but they thought it was really beautiful as we sat around the campfire hearing the uh, clicks and pops. Um, now, the NFB put that on ice temporarily, but it may be coming out. And they said I was going to be the principal one in the pilot release. Guys, <laughs> I guess they found what I do so fascinating. So they said, "You're the dude for the pilot." Uh, and then they had a new change of administration, and it got axed or iced. So unfortunately, I'm going. Oh shucks. So, so each of the five people, you being one of them, um, one whole episode yeah. would be dedicated to your work. And yeah, I guess they were going to have a good, significant segment of the whole doc uh, uh, done. It was going to be a, uh, an interactive documentary. We can click on things, and there's little videos that come up, and it was going to be that way with graphics. And they were going to release some kind of pilot, which I'm not sure what form that would have would have been in. Uh, they they were interviewing people up on, in the Arctic too about the aurora and the sky electricity up there. Um, so that's all on ice. So it's been kind of a, uh, and that was um, two years ago to. Two, two springs ago they showed up, the NFB 2015. So uh, I haven't really been uh, interviewed uh, since then, uh, then uh, until uh, today, this unexpected uh, visit that I didn't know about until uh, 9 this morning when I got a call from Aaron. And I didn't know about it either until this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I was around good, to see the uh, phone uh, display say, oh, Aaron called, okay, get back quickly. Maybe he's coming down here. I hope, I hope. And then he says uh, Eric needed some medical attention and they were going to come back down here to drop Eric off at his car in Lone Pine, 15 minutes away. So here we are out in Keeler. You know, besides oral 
chorus.com um, like a couple years ago uh, when we did a conference it was actually at the uh, Eagles Lodge downtown Coeur d'Alene yes. in uh, uh, Hayden where yeah really that is. was a real gift and, uh, to go to there and so that presentation's on naturalvlfradio.com and you shared um, a lot of slideshows on a lot of the different places that you've been to and, <laughs> and played yeah. a lot of different audio clip samples so people can kind of you know, get I, mean, I made my apparently I, I made my inter, my uh, presentation longer than the time allocated, and uh, I uh, I was so excited and I was nervous and I was scattered and it didn't it didn't quite turn out the way I wanted to, but I did I did get a lot through though, and I even brought some WR threes, which uh, four of them got snapped up right away right away from some great people in the uh, in Coeur d'Alene there. So it was nice to hang out, see Eric do his talk, and. Uh, See uh, Aaron and everybody, and go to that amazing conference. I, I was so stoked when when uh, when you invited me that spring, and so then I just went full full gear mode to try to, uh, and I began to actually draw three pages of notes and how I was going to do the presentation. And of course, as soon as I got to the podium, it all like fell apart in my head, and I had to ad lib all the way. But uh, it was fun, and that afternoon, I think it was um, after lunch on Sun. No, it was Sunday morning. And somebody said it was nice to have a Sunday morning uh, kickback presentation of of some uh, different subject than the um, you know the uh, energy stuff. So, but what is electricity? It's all energy anyway. And that's what radio. It's a little tiny little microvolts and picovolts of energy <laughs> from uh, the uh, ether. <laughs> So, the, so these units, um, some of the schematics you were mentioning, are um, you actually have a couple posted on uh, your website. Oh, schematics yeah. for, say, how to build a natural radio receiver? Yeah. The, oh, yeah, I totally encourage people. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to just say, oh, oh, buy my receiver, I'm promoting it, you know, so sort of underhandedly. Uh, no, I've got schematics on my website because I just, I love, that's what I did as a, a younger person. People were giving me schematics. That's what got me to know how to make these things. And I must I must return that gift by uh, uh, having schematics on my website on uh, how to do it all yourself. Uh, and there's there's something called the BBB4, which is linked on my site. I started uploading that on the primitive internet in 1993, text only. That's why there's a text schematic because it was all ASCII text, and I was dumping it on a 1200 baud connection <laughs> through a phone line into the. Uh, the old Usenet groups, you know, there's no World Wide Web, it was just barely beginning in 93. The website didn't start till 95. Um, my Aurora Chorus um, began, began in 96 or so. So I began hacking out the HTML on a text editor. But uh, yeah, lots of schematics on the site. And I wish there were more, but you can get, they're all over online too. There's a lot, ton of other sites, uh, people doing this now. I think it was because of my, uh, Frank and myself and my mentor, Mike Mitticke. We were the ones that reintroduced natural radio to the world in the early to mid 90s. We started a whole re-movement, re-movement <laughs> uh, of it. And uh, even Stanford University, the Halliwell book, Whistlers and related ionospheric phenomena got republished. I heard they told me because of my uh, not not trying to brag here at all, but my my Mike started it, my mentor, but I really uh, popularized natural radio, you know, and uh, they ended up seeing a demand in that book, hugely increase on the history of. Uh, Natural Radio, Robert Helliwell. Now it's available on Internet Archives as a PDF. And how's the last name spelled? H e l h e h e l i w e l l. So Helliwell, uh, Robert. Yeah, just Google that or search it or Bing or whatever, and you, you it'll pop up on Internet Archives too. Just key in. Uh, oh, Robert so, so, Helliwell, so it's a free pop download. right up. Yeah, so it's a free download archive. now. Okay. But if you want the hard copy, I guess you can get it somewhere. Or Amazon or something. Or... Yeah. So the um, uh, besides your website, the presentation, maybe that book. Are there other books or videos you recommend people read or watch to um, you know if they want to get more into this and learn more? About yeah, it? well, there's a really uh, well, a lot of stuff online. But Aaron, if you could grab me that book in the back, there somebody turned me on to this in twenty. Just last year, they said, you're in this. And it was a book by a guy, uh, Douglas, Douglas Kahn, uh, 
at the University of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. And he's an academic there involved in arts and whatnot. And he interviewed a lot of people about uh, natural radio, different perspectives of it. Um, it was Douglas Kahn, K-A-H-N. K-A-H-N. And he mentions me too briefly in this. Uh, unfortunately, I think I had an opportunity to uh, interview him or be interviewed by him, but uh, I think I was elsewhere or maybe uh, in a disinterested mode or some for some weird reason we never connected. But it does mention my recordings of some of the uh, most astounding, astounding ever because there's been people before me doing this since the 50s. Uh, Morgan and uh, 4G, F-O-R-G-E-Y, William 4G who put a cor Don Chorus track on a Pink Floyd album <laughs> that was released in 1996. And I was jealous, I said. <laughs> How can I get my sig signal sounds on a Pink Floyd album? Well, it's gone far beyond that today because I, I'm now known as the uh, principal uh, recordist of this stuff. But what I love about Earth Sound, Earth Signal book that Douglas Kahn has written here, Interesting Prose, is that it gets into the history of natural radio listening beginning with Dr. Watson in 1873. And that fascinated me. I had never read an account of that before. What the telegraph lines? The telegraph line listening and the uh, trans, mm -hmm. no amplifier, just a transducer. It evidently was high impedance enough that it would just, and the wire was long enough, it just worked. <laughs> yeah. Any um, uh, announcements or any final words you want to share with anybody? Or? Well, I'm consulting in Iceland and hoping to go back in September if the funding is there. It's a startup company, and we're going to be doing some cool things. And of course, uh, as a hobbyist, tubes out of the business, I'll just play tourist, and uh, we'll go. Uh, my my collaborator there, we go outside of Reykjavik and make uh, some cool recordings of the natural radio at high latitudes in the auroral zone. That's coming up. Um, I'm just sort of in hunker down from the heat mode this summer. I go out a few times here and there and record uh, whistlers and static and stuff. Um, I'm working with Eric, or want to go up to Paul and see Eric uh, in the next few weeks, because uh, what he's doing with the uh, musical seismograph and the long lines is like astounding, and it's, it's gratifying to see that coming together again. You know, it, all, all projects of all types reach sometimes reach you hit speed bumps. <laughs> And they come to stalling points, and, and Eric had some medical issues, but it looks like things are going again. So I'm going to be traveling a bit more this summer than I usually do, or since I have been in many years, and I want to see the eclipse in eastern Oregon on the 21st of August. And I, I'm going to be bringing natural radio receivers and tuning in the medium wave broadcast band, hopefully uh, when uh, the uh, sun, uh, sun, at the center line when the sun covers the, Moon covers the sun, sorry, during this total eclipse. That has amazing effects from ELF into the uh, short wave or HF frequencies. The ionosphere changes into a nighttime mode hmm. just briefly. The D layer disappears and the ionosphere shifts into night mode for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and it's an amazing thing, and I want to see what natural radio does. Hoping it comes together for the Oregon trip in August. Uh, and then we'll see what goes from there. So um, the uh, antenna lines out near uh, Eric's shop. Um, yeah. Can you plug those directly into one of these receivers as the antenna? Uh, or? Actually, actually, uh, I've developed. I, I made Eric a prototype, which is in the house. It was a dual mode E field that takes one of these. And no, you can't do it with the whip version because it just completely overloaded. It. It's high impedance, and it just needs a short antenna for relatively high sensitivity. But I did make him a loop, H, a B field or H field design. That's three ohm input. He's a transformer, and uh, Eric was able to successfully uh, connect that to his long lines and hear stuff. But it sounded to me like it was overloading too. Uh, so some, some kind of attenuation pad is needed. But sure, it's perfectly fine. The only the only Eric Eric of course is. Uh, Lamenting the fact that Nevada Nevada Energy, uh, the power grid nearby, the long lines, is really causing horrible interference. Uh, like t 100 dBm uh, at 9 kilohertz and below, so it's really it's really a difficult uh, place to hear natural radio right there. But it's perfectly fine for higher uh, higher up the farther you get away from the AC power or harmonics. So. Uh, 
If were the power grid to go away, the long lines would be astounding. It would be the most sensitive natural radio receiver on Earth. Yeah, I Truly. Think, uh, towards the end of last year, um, Eric had sent me some video, which I think I put that up on uh, my YouTube channel yeah. for uh, people to see some of the demos and some of the latest yeah. work. Um, him and Justin did. And when uh, driving over there later today, probably get set up, and then tomorrow we'll probably you know redo some of those videos and people can kind of get a cool. Yeah, a little better quality and picture sound and picture. oh yeah, you know I'm I'm going oh bum too bad there wasn't one of those sheep wool things over the phone because you made some great interviews out in the uh, field with Eric but the wind noise was getting in the microphone. Well, I have a uh, new microphone here and then I got something called a dead cat. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Which looks like a dead cat literally that slips over. So hopefully that'll yeah, that's exactly that's good. Uh, just gets rid. Block. Yeah, you could be in a gale force <laughs> wind and not even hear it. Yeah, good. So, yeah. Well, good. Well, I'm glad we um, got to see you again. You know, it's been, been wonderful. Years, yeah, and, very uh, unexpected, like, good, joy. Uh, yeah. surprise trip here. And, uh, um, yeah, thanks for your time. And you know, Aaron, thank you. Thanks to Tom time. for your support and the website and all that, too, and the trip to Idaho in July 2015. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll see him up there, so I'll see you up there sometime, too. Yeah, looking forward to it. You know. Right. Well, Welcome. thanks a lot, Stephen. Well, thank you, Aaron. Okay. loops hanging on Joshua trees. <laughs> Joshua trees make great uh, loop uh, supports and or I'll, li or I'll listen on the WR3 or uh, the uh, prototype uh, unit here. So, so is that large unit, is that going to be available on a Royal Chorus? We're hoping, com, yeah. Or? It may never be uh, actually commercially released but mm -hmm. and of course it would take a smaller form but Humans can't make surface mount technology. It's really it's right robotic. But we can only put together like uh, larger components, like DIP, uh, which is what I do. So it just has uh, this board and another auxiliary amp board, and uh, and then we wanted a nice big loudspeaker so tourists could listen to the aurora borealis sounds of natural radio, which up in the auroral zone, uh, where I've traveled to several times in Canada and Alaska is wild. Natural radio up in Alaska, northern Canada is, is crazy. And Iceland too, and so the idea is to let visitors use a portable receiver and hear it for themselves. Um, the conference in 2015, and uh, no, no, wait a minute, it was December, uh, right, December of that year, uh, we met for a couple of days, that's right, of course, uh, Eric's lab, Eric's secret lab. But uh, yeah, Eric, I guess had an eye infection and needed to come south, so good you could yeah, he's I'm here. Lo Excellent. Lo Lone Pine and <laughs> took an ambulance up to uh, yeah. uh, Bishop, and so on my way down wow. to uh, Eric's shop, then we had to you know detour it over there. And since you're only 15 miles from uh, Lone Pine or so, or so, yeah, so I might as well you know swing by and <laughs> pay a visit. Head a little east into the uh, raw desert. Right, right. And so the the small unit you showed that was that's probably the most popular one, and you got a big, you have a larger unit there with. Yeah, this one is uh, was developed uh, for as a prototype for a company in Iceland, and you can see it here, ElfTech, and uh, they're online. So uh, I think it's elftech.is, and uh, it's for an eventual proprietary the edge oh. of Death Valley National Park, the eastern edge, uh, mm -hmm. and there's this famous road, the old highway to Death Valley. Uh, it's not Highway 190 into the Panamint Valley now. It went through Darwin, uh, uh, and uh, then it went through Darwin Wash, which is just an amazing wonderland of a river and trees and uh, a pond, and it's all hidden in this canyon, Darwin Canyon. And then it would go from there to the Panamint Valley and eastward. That was the old Death Valley Road. So a lot of tourists like to go uh, into Darwin and go the old Death Valley route. It's really beautiful. Uh, way to go and you get treated with the uh, greenery in the canyon so uh, I love to go up there for visiting friends and for natural radio listening because uh, it's really my favorite area of Inyo County and it's completely power line free being uh, uh, several uh, miles from power lines once you leave Darwin and I love the granite boulder hills and I go in there and I I'll set up Terry still uh, autumn 2017 uh, um, project we're doing actually a couple but uh, it's just it's just a it's got a nice speaker on it and you can hear just getting the power line uh, hum. 
it, it's very loud and bassy, or you can high pass, low pass, high pass it. And uh, it was just a proto development, but. I love the uh, metal box ones. Two of them I made uh, for Iceland so much, I just threw together one in a plastic case so I could uh, have the same thing. <laughs> and uh, it's been fun. A couple weeks ago, I was up in the town of uh, Darwin, in the, by the old cemetery in Darwin, California, this little town of 35 people, and uh, heard loud whistlers at like uh, 8.30 in the morning there with that unit blaring out the speakers. So I headed... Uh, uh, west a few miles and erected a magnetic loop and did some more serious listening. So it's like right on the edge of uh, Death Valley. Yeah, uh, Darwin is right on the uh, right on really literally about three miles from. Well, this is Aaron Murakami down here in um, California at Steve McGreevy's uh, secret radio lab here. And this is actually where he uh, builds his uh, frequency devices for listening in to the uh, Earth sound. <laughs> he has what partially there's built. A, partially the beginning built, of one. Uh, WR3, uh, yeah, yeah. I've got to four on order that I've got to hustle out in the next two weeks. And, uh, you know, the parts come in and then I incrementally uh, put them together. The potentiometer, the knob, the BNC jack all get screwed on the cases. And then uh, the circuit, circuit board gets put into it. And uh, then they get a little test. and. Out they go. And of course, that's on auroralchorus.com, and I'll yeah. subtitle this with the with the website. And so this has been kind of a uh, kind of a surprise trip. We didn't really plan on coming here. We were yeah. Um, uh, I'm very happy. I haven't seen uh, you since uh, 